her recent art projects in, that incorporate science. Please welcome Victoria Gibson. Okay, so uh, my name is Victoria, and I my core training is in music. But when I had children, I had to retire from touring, and I became a graphic designer. So I got into being a visual artist, and I was a commercial graphic designer until I got too good to be employed. Then I became more of an integrated media artist because I started using my skills in graphic design, video making, etc., in uh, doing my artwork. I, I wrote a song about science uh, in the 70s, 80s, something like that, and I was always interested in physics, and when I got the opportunity to go to university, I did the science of sound with Dr. William Unruh. So I do have a bit of a background knowledge but I was actively discouraged from being a scientist when I was young. I was always interested in science, and I was told, oh, girls, you know, don't really do that kind of thing. And, oh, well, you should just think about being a homemaker. A home ec is very interesting. Of course, you could take that. You know? So I ended up being shunted off to the sidelines and not being able to take any science courses in high school beyond the elementary level. And when I went for math help, my teacher told me, oh, don't worry, dear. I give all the girls a C. You don't really need to know this stuff. You're just going to have kids, and your husband will look after all this for you. Yeah, he thought he was being kind. I did get a C, but I didn't get any help. Later, I went to Khan Academy on YouTube, and I passed my GRE. <laughs> yes. But no thanks to my high school teachers. So uh, with my longing for science, of course, I bought a file code. I figured, OK, then at least I'm partway there. I have a lab code. So I started thinking that, you know, scientists must also have to have kids and take sabbaticals off to look after their children if they have some crises, whatever. And I started thinking about how quantum physics around the home. Like, if I was Dr. Octavia Tactilia, and I had my PhD, in quantum physics, not quantum theory exactly, but I just analyzed the results. Then I could find out new things. And so I started thinking about things. And I started thinking, science is everywhere. Physics is everywhere. One of the problems with being a physicist is I start seeing physics everywhere I go. When I'm doing the laundry, for example, I see physics. This leads me to the conclusion physics is happening everywhere, even though it's on a, such a small level, and even at lower energy levels without big colliders and that sort of thing. 
but basically people take it for granted. We take physics for granted every day. We don't even think about it. But I was on sabbatical working at home in the domestic environment, and I was thinking about it. And I came up with socks. Yes, socks. Because in my dryer, I would often have one sock emerge when two socks went in. <laughs> have you ever experienced this? The one sock phenomenon? Anecdotal evidence supports the fact that this is a widespread phenomenon, yet it is completely ignored by science. When you are doing the laundry, you carefully place everything into your washer. I have my own washer and dryer, so I know that no one else is interfering with this process. It is a controlled experiment. I put my wash into the washing machine and then into the dryer. That is the culprit. This is where the science begins. What emerges from the dryer is a single sock. Not a pair of socks that I put in there. No, a single sock. Now, what is the explanation for this? Octavia Tactilia does not believe in magic. I do not believe that somehow there's some magic spell that makes my socks disappear. No. Through anecdotal evidence, large numbers of people report a single sock missing in their dryers. Anecdotal evidence is becoming a valuable tool in science reporting. I am a member of the Audubon Society and I report my bird sightings and these are becoming very valuable to science. And all of you, when I said this about the dryer and the sock, many of you felt that feeling inside. Yes, someone is recognizing this as a scientific problem. This phenomenon is not receiving any attention at all. Everyone is focused on colliding with big CERN colliders and large particle accelerators and that sort of thing. But they don't realize that in your home, in your dryer, it is in black and white. There are possibility that wormholes could be created under the unique and specific circumstances present in your dryer not just in the vastness of outer space, not just giant wormholes that people are going to drive spacecrafts through in, or Deep Space Nine or whatever. Tiny, tiny ones that are just temporary and just enough for a sock to be sucked in, never to be seen in your laundry again. This is the uh, wormhole theory. Like black holes, wormholes arise as valid solutions to the equations of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. And like black holes, they were named in 1957 by the American physicist John Wheeler. Wormholes are a conduit through four-dimensional space and not just through our three-dimensional space-time. This could explain missing socks. There are forces in our dryer. Any one of you has felt the static electricity as you take out that nylon thing that you didn't think you should have put in there. Uh, there's heat, rotation, resonant frequencies, and static electricity. Rotation is a common aspect of nature and sometimes can build up amazing forces to simple things like changes in air pressure. Uh, you can get tornadoes. And then even in the galaxies, rotation is a huge part of how our universe functions. So when we are creating rotation, adding heat, and creating static electricity, wormholes could be the result. Could there be low energy wormholes? The combination of forces creates a wormhole with enough power to suck in a sock, but it's unstable. At these low energy levels, it only exists for a brief moment, just enough to suck that sock in, and then it's over. So this is going to be a very transient phenomenon that will be very difficult to observe. We just reserve the result of only one sock. 
So I will require funding to examine this. We will have to take the dryers into the lab. We will have to have big machines to analyze and replicate drier conditions. The, re the wormholes of low energy could be significant in the scientific usefulness of things, or maybe not. Uh, in some cases, very rare, I have found a small sock that did not belong to any member of my family in my dryer. What could explain this phenomenon? Well, the white wormhole. Octavia, thinking about this, has come up with the idea that a white wormhole can briefly get enough energy to deposit a sock through space-time into your dryer. But it's only the smallest socks that get it has enough energy to deposit. It can't move a larger sock. Uh, the low velocities by the, the rotation and the electricity inside the dryer just aren't enough to spit out a bigger sock. Even though the reverse process of the black hole seems to require lower energy because it's much more commonly observed. Thank you very much. I will require more funding in order to research this more carefully and to satisfy everyone's uh, curiosity about where are my socks going. Thank you very much. So uh, this sort of fits in with some of the other presentations in that uh, I think that in order to teach science effectively, you have to engage people. And a way of engaging people is through their sense of humor. So I thought that this would be a kind of a fun thing. And also it's a bit serious because women have often had to, uh, had had their ideas discounted. It's like socks disappear in the dryer. Everyone knows that, but no one investigates it or takes it seriously because it's a domestic issue. Uh, so th this is another social aspect of Dr. Octavia is that uh, she's not only a female scientist with wacky ideas, but they might actually come up to be uh, some grain of truth in there for some reason. Uh, who knows? But my other scientific uh, thing is I do love birds. As I said, I'm a member of Audubon Society and I have the app on my phone and I'm always watching birds. But I found that people didn't see birds. I'd be walking along and people who didn't normally watch birds and I'd be going, oh, look, look, there's a bird. No. Oh, where, where? They wouldn't see the bird. And so I thought, okay, I have to get people to see these birds because the urban environment is encroaching on bird habitat. Every time they crunch down one of these older single family homes and they build a bunch of condo buildings, they're taking away bird habitat. I live on unseeded bird land and it's my job to put out those seeds because that's my rent to pay those birds back for taking their space. I really am talking about something that's happening all around you. There's beautiful birds that live in British Columbia, and they're being squeezed out by invader birds, by lack of habitat, and by lack of resources. So I just want people to see the birds that we have, and how I'm doing that is I'm by getting people to play with them. So I'll just turn this on for a second, and I, then I need a couple of volunteers.
So how this works is uh, you can change the, uh, the image. It's interactive. So on each screen with the birds, you can play around with it. It's not just a static thing. So if you're interested in checking it out, there's a variety of birds and you can play around with the controls and uh, I'll try and get the sound working better because I didn't test the sound. It's my fault. Uh, so, you know, you're welcome to come up and play around and try it. I've got one gesture control. Here, I'll put it on one that it really works nicely on. See when the, my hand is all the way down? And then it's hard to reach over. See it changes between the two videos and you can do video mixing. Uh, and there's other effects that I have built into this to program it. And then you can uh, uh, change this one. So you can see the red winged blackbird. And then there's a different picture of the red wing backward. And uh, so you're welcome to come and play around with this and uh, interact with it. But I thought, uh, I don't know much about birds really. I just have done some reading and I, I just love them. And I love to look at them and I wanted to share that with people. So I find that mediating that through technology is a way to get people to look at birds and to sort of identify with them more and maybe they might be interested in preserving their habitat or feeding them or even just watching them. Anyway, that's my connection to uh, science and uh, I hope you're going to enjoy the exhibit.